<laughs> no, I didn't see the movie, but uh, one oh, of our chats, <laughs> one of our chat, Josh says Jeremy again with the food recommend. <laughs> Oh, my God. oh no. Welcome to Recotopia, a happy home for recommended movies, TV shows, music, video games, foodstuffs, and more from three people you can definitely trust. Trustability varies by region, no guarantees implied. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Atkinson, Jeremy Scott, and Aaron Dicer. Fates intertwine, cosmic coincidence, you know? Oh, you're full of shit. All that crap, I'm full of shit. You're a monument of it. You have bullshitted yourself. All I am is taking out the garbage, killing bad people. Well, uh, well that's what you said. Do you believe me? Hello, everybody. It is Recotopia episode 98. Today's big recommend will be Collateral. I'm joined by Aaron Dicer. Hey, that's me. And Jeremy Scott. That's you. And I'm Chris Atkinson. Hey, that's me. And, uh, welcome, chat, uh, for coming in here today. Thank you guys for coming in. And uh, uh, and uh, chat's already lively, and everybody's saying hello and good morning, and I'm um, having my coffee and all that other type of stuff. Mm-hmm. And all that. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love that type of stuff. Anyway, uh, anybody have any small recommends to kick us off? It's no big deal. <laughs> It's so small and light. It's small, it's tiny, it's petite, it's wee. Mm-hmm. Um, I will start. Do it. I will start with a brand new film on Netflix called Society of the Snow, uh, directed by J.A. Bayona. Um, oh, yeah. Who has had an interesting career. Uh, he directed The Orphanage and A Monster Calls, but he also directed Jurassic World, Fallen, whatever, Order. Um <laughs> Uh, while prepping for this, I looked him up. He's nine days older than me, um, mm. which means he's like 15 days older than Dice or something. Like <laughs> right, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, comparing that to my own accomplishments, um, he's made a lot more films than I have. Uh, this is a, a new film about the story you've probably heard before of the rugby team from Uruguay that crashes in the Andy Mountains on their way to Chile. Um, there was a film called Alive back in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, Ethan Hawke was in it, um, and uh, this Society of the Snow is going for a much more realistic take. Um, there are no Hollywood stars in this. Uh, most of these guys are unknowns and or first-time actors, uh, guys and girls. Um, uh, it's all in um, Spanish, um, <clears throat> and it's so realistic that I don't know that I will ever watch it again. Um, this is not like Requiem for a Dream, where I say it's great, but I never want to see it again, but you don't necessarily need to see it. I kind of feel like this is one of those films people need to see um, because it is hugely inspiring as much as it is harrowing. Um, But uh, the plane crash is the most frightening plane crash I've ever seen in a movie, ever. I was watching it like this, (laughs) <laughs> literally had my, my arm over my mouth um if you are concerned and you should be uh look up does the dog die for any triggers you might have uh if you know a little bit about the story you know some of the awful things they had to do to survive um but uh it is just a home run of a film in my opinion and i hope that it gets some awards acknowledgement so there you go it's on netflix <laughs> Brand new, 90 on Rotten Tomatoes, 7.9 on IMDb, which is high for IMDb. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And I loved it, uh, but I may never watch it again. <clears throat> I agree. It's kind of like uh, United 93 in that way, right? Where it's just like this yeah. important inspirational movie that I, you just don't, you know, like it's just hard to watch. And this one this one is like that uh, as well. Uh, unless Chris doesn't think so. Chris, what was the what was <laughs> no, the I didn't about- see the movie, but uh, one, oh, of our chat, <laughs> one of our chat, Josh, says, Jeremy again with the food recommend. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, no. Oh my I God. wondered why you were laughing oh when I mentioned God. United 93. No, oh no. <laughs> That was okay. I was not paying attention. Okay. So that, that laugh no, no, no. was not for no, no, no. That's completely understandable. <laughs> completely understandable. Uh Josh Josh Zero uh just ending the podcast uh with that comment. Uh just oh amazing. Uh no, I, I second uh Jeremy's thoughts on this and and uh to encourage a watch. It it does it it does everything alive does better. 
because yeah. it feels more authentic. It feels more real. It feels less Hollywoody. It, it corrects a lot of the mistakes that movie made in casting. I'm telling you right so. now, I would be one of those people that just fell asleep and died the first night. I would not last in this yeah. situation. Yeah. And what it takes for them to, to do it is it's incredible. <clears throat> yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's wild. Possibly the greatest survival story of all time. It's, it's pretty impressive. So, yeah. Uh, all right, Aaron. Uh, my small recommend is a Studio Ghibli film called Only Yesterday. Uh, this is 1991. Mm. I'd never even heard of this before, uh, but I've been trying to um, get a little more into uh, that studio stuff and kind of go through in order the, the stuff that they're doing uh, or have done. Uh, Isayo... Uh, Takahata, I'm going to say, I could be completely wrong. I apologize if I am, uh, wrote and directed this. This is his follow-up to Grave of the Fireflies, which I think I've oh, talked yeah. about previously on the show. It's a great um, movie. This is also a great movie. I was mm -hmm. blown away by this movie. In fact, I, um, I'm really blown away that it was a dude that wrote and directed this because it feels so there's an authentically, in my opinion, again, I'm a man as well, so maybe it's not, but it's, it feels like an authentically female story here coming of age where uh, a woman who is in her twenties is nostalgic for the memories of her youth, but, but then also remembering the trauma and the different things that happened and how it's informing who she is today. Um, it's, it's pretty impressive emotional work. I was engaged the entire time just in who this woman is, how she became that way. Uh, some of the childhood stuff is just, um, it's that childhood stuff where you're just like, oh, I remember, like it makes you remember being a kid and what it, what it felt like to be confused or in awe of things, or um, it's, just, it's just really empathetic work. And I, I really enjoy this movie. Hmm. So um, I, I wanted to throw it on people's awareness pile because it was not like, on my awareness pile at all. Yeah, awareness those movies pile. seem to slip through the cracks a lot of times. Like I didn't, I had never heard of Graveyard of the Fireflies until like I looked at the IMDb top hundred one time, mm -hmm. and I was like, "What the hell is this?" And I had, and it was really hard to find that movie too. So like you know, but mm -hmm. I, I, all these movies seem to slip. I've never heard of this movie. So yeah, I hadn't um, either. So yeah, it's there's a lot on uh, on my list as well that I still need to see. I uh, I recently uh, got a, a, a Studio Ghibli like box set that has like all of their movies. So that's kind of how I've been working That'd through. Nice. I would highly recommend it. Um, it's a mm -hmm. it's a great work through. So yeah, yeah. Mm. How many of them are in that set? Oh, I don't remember. It's a lot. I was going to say, lots and lots. Yeah. Lots mm -hmm. and lots. Chris, did you have any small recommends? Good. Um, uh, the Holdovers. Uh, oh. Alexander Payne's uh, not so new one now at this point. I've watched this probably a month and a half ago, somewhere around there. But this stars uh, Paul Giamatti, who's always great and who's always, I feel like, going to be under represented by Oscar nominations and awards uh, for his work in all sorts of uh all sorts of things i think he still to this day has only been nominated one time and that was cinderella man which is just hard to believe wow. considering what he has uh done over his career but um this uh this uh is about a uh a school a private school where he's a not a very popular teacher whatsoever um uh, people hate taking his classes and uh because he does something um he does something that uh, offends the the head uh, principal guy of the school he is uh, made to be the guy who has to stay for christmas vacation while and ba basically babysit for kids who have been left behind uh, uh, or can't go home for the whatever reason, or there's all sorts of different reasons. It's like six or seven kids who get left behind. So he has to do that duty. One of the kids played by a newcomer play, his name is Dominic Sessa, uh, is he has, he has his plans for Christmas. He's going to go, he's going to go to this, like, you know, Island or something, this tropical paradise or something. And those plans fall through. And, and this is after he's bragged everybody where he's going and all of that. And then he finds out, oh, now I'm going to have to stay here. And he can't get in contact with his parents. And so, like, and also at the last minute, this, this other kid's parents comes in and says, I'm paying for a ski trip for everybody as long as you get your parents' permission. Oh, and so, no. <laughs> and so, like, all these other kids get to go on a ski trip while he's, he can't get a hold of his parents for any reason. So, most of the movie is 
Paul Giamatti and Dominic Sessa in the school and, and interacting and, you know, having this like, you know, hate, hate relationship and everything. But if you know movies, you know that this starts to starts to warm over a little bit as they get to understand each other a little bit more throughout the uh, throughout the picture. Um, another, uh, uh, another adult in this picture, uh, played by divine joy Randolph, you may have seen in murders, uh, only murders in the building and stuff like that. Also great in this movie. She plays a woman whose son has, uh, who's been killed in Vietnam and she's still struggling with it. Um, and, uh, this movie is yeah, set in the like 1970 or something like that. So, um, Typical great Alexander Payne stuff um, here. And if you were a fan of uh, especially something like Sideways, which I think uh, goes along well with this movie because of the Giamatti connection and the Payne connection, um, I, I think you'll really, really love this one too. So uh, good Giamatti movie. won a Golden Globe last night. And there's a photo going around social media of him sitting at In-N-Out Burger in his tux with the Golden mm -hmm. Globe sitting on the table. And it <laughs> reminds me of that scene in Sideways at the end where he takes his fancy bottle of wine to some fast food joint uh, and sits there quietly eating it. Anyway. I thought that, <laughs> that's, that's a purposeful ref reference, right? Like that was, he did that purposefully to imitate that i just that's so perfect right like know. that's so perfect i've uh, seen pl plenty of golfers will win the masters and then do something totally normal with the green jacket mm -hmm. on like go to mcdonald's or yeah whatever. yeah um but yeah it could be a reference to that and it's amazing i mean he obviously liked working with alexander payne um i have uh it, it, this this is my vote this year for a uh, movie i would be absolutely shocked if jeremy didn't absolutely love i like i this this movie is going to be uh it will be shocking to me if you don't enjoy this jeremy it's so fun it's so interesting divine uh joy randolph is is almost a lock to win the oscar for this like oh she's, yeah i didn't she, realize that yeah she's the front runner um for best supporting actress so um it's it's really good i love you mentioned the ski trip thing i love how this movie isn't afraid like it almost sets it up like oh here's all the buddies and we're gonna get to know this group and then all of a sudden it's like nope they're all gone and this is yep. really about these two and it's i love <laughs> yep. that it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's it feels it's almost great. brave because in most movies now like every character has to have an arc every character is with us from beginning to end and this movie's like no we're going to focus on uh where the story wants us to focus and i i just think it's it really benefits from that and yes i saw the question by flyboy that's way up on the chat now that asked he didn't get nominated for sideways no he did not get nominated no for sideways. he did not so that's what that's that's the point like he just there's so many like american splendor is one he should have been nominated nominated for and didn't sideways is nominated one. For private parts god he could have been yeah nominated. for private parts which was one of his first parts. movie like first big role movies anyway but anyway yeah. um okay well we're on our big recommend which is collateral and it's jeremy's so take it away i'm fine i'm fine it's just that you're so big it's so huge it's a good rule but this is bigger than rules it's bigger on the inside is it i noticed oh shit this was my recommend. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I have not seen uh, Collateral in many years, probably seven or eight years. And boy, did I have fun watching this movie again. Um, Michael Mann absolutely owns L.A. at night. There's mm -hmm. nobody that can shoot that city at night with mood and action and character development. Uh, I just I came away with a even more appreciation for his directing style. Um, we open with Tom Cruise, whose name is Vincent, also played a character named Vincent in Color of Money. Uh, there's your <laughs> trivia for the day. Uh, he's at an airport and he bumps into Jason Statham and they both drop their bags and pick up the other person's bag and talk about characters that stay with us from beginning to end of the movie. Jason Statham is not one of them. He is gone <laughs> after this. Um, I was confused. I had to go check. Uh, and he was certainly famous and starring in movies uh, at this point. So this mm -hmm. is either a favor or a cameo or a happy little coincidence. But Jason Statham is obviously giving Vincent some stuff he couldn't take on the plane. I wonder what it could be. Then we cut over to Max, the cabbie, Jamie Foxx. Jamie Foxx spells his name with two X's, and I found myself in my notes spelling Max with two X's for about half the movie before I realized what I was doing. Um, <laughs> this is his uh, first of two Maxes, because he plays Max in uh, Amazing Spider-Man. He does. And, uh, well, then later in uh, No Way Home. Um <clears throat> So he's coming on the evening shift for a taxi company. Um, you can tell he's a little bit of a clean freak because he windexes the dash and the uh, 
uh, the steering wheel, although I would do that too if I shared a cab with any other drivers. Uh, he takes a little postcard of a tropical island and puts it in the visor, and we will see him later look at that for moments of peace and zen uh, when his customers, like Sherilyn, I think it's Sherilyn Fenn, um, get too obnoxious. Um, <clears throat> and one of his first passengers he picks up is Jada Pinkett. And we'll find out Actually, later. Actually, that she's... was uh, Debbie Mazar. Debbie Mazar, about. not Sherilyn yeah. Penn. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. There's always, every generation has two actors, female or male, that I get confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I wonder if it's a direct reference. But she bosses him around on what route to take, exactly like Holly Hunter does in broadcast news. Like, oh, yeah. take this, take the five, then take it over to this, then take Garden down. To... And it's just hilarious to me. And maybe that's just a common taxi passenger, and that's why it mm. ends up in multiple movies. But it felt like a reference. Um, yeah. He thinks there's a better route, though. And so they make a playful bet on it. Um, uh, and he of course ends up being right. I would never bet against a cabbie on what route is fastest, no matter how much time I've spent in a city. That's just dumb. Um, <laughs> he's right. They get there faster and she's impressed. Um, and he tells her a story about how he's just driving this cab, uh, until he can get his own limo company up and running. Um, and as they part, um, he gives her his Island postcard. So she can take a mental vacation because she basically admits to him that she's terrified every time before a big trial. Uh, and she's touched by that and gives him her business card. This will be important later. Um, <clears throat> the next passenger he picks up immediately is Vincent. And Max almost misses him by just not realizing he's outside the door. And this is one of 15 massive coincidences uh, that will happen in this movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't mind. If we were sinning this movie, uh, well, we'd, we'd be racking up a score. There, there's, there's, a, there's at least one that I was thinking, oh, come on. But then I realized, you know, it, this actually could happen, but there's several others in there that no, they, no, they can't. So, yeah, <laughs> I totally agree with you. So uh, Vin Vincent uh, does get in Max's cab after Max is like, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, and pretty quickly tells him he's got five stops to make for a real estate deal, and then he's going back to LAX to fly out on Red Eye, and he offers $700 to Max to drive him around all night. And despite the fact that this is against the rules, um, Max says okay, because hey, $700. Uh, I think all of us would accept this in this instant. Vincent gets out at the first stop and says, meet me in the alley behind the building, uh, then promptly goes upstairs and throws somebody out a glass window onto the taxi. Max is, uh, you know, understandably wigged the fuck out by this uh, and tries to leave, but Vincent pulls a gun and forces him to help him move the body into the trunk. And it's at this point, after they take off, that we meet Mark Ruffalo. Um, and Mark Ruffalo is a cop. He shows up to this apartment where the body was just thrown out the window, and there's obviously a crime that has happened, but there is no body. There is some blood and glass on the ground, and he calls for other detectives and backup. Next, we see Max and Vincent again, and Max is freaking out, but Vincent is basically saying, you know, I'll, I'll kill you if you don't help me, so help me. And then they get pulled over by cops. Um, and I don't know that this is a coincidence, but it is a huge favor from the universe that right as the cops are about to make him open the trunk, uh, they get called to a more important call. It's one um, of the big ones. <laughs> that's a big, big one. Um, because Vincent is saying to him, if they open that trunk, they're going inside. Um, and what I love about this Vincent character, the way he's written and the way he's played, is he pegs Max's character immediately. As a, as a man of conscience, a man who can be manipulated based on his conscience and morality. This is a guy who doesn't want to see any innocent people die, even these cops. But the cops get called away. Hooray. Um, and uh, they are able to continue on to the next stop. While Vincent is up murdering victim number two in a penthouse, he zip ties Max to the steering wheel. Max honks and flashes the lights. This is the most realistic part of the movie, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. People who see him flashing the lights are not coming to help him. They're bad people who want to harm him and steal shit. <laughs> um, and he is, of course, zip tied to the steering wheel and can't help. But Vincent arrives just in time uh, and in a, a very cool scene, uh, kills the bad guys uh, and I have a note from INDB that I found during research that apparently the scene, like Tom Cruise's gun handling, is so good that they use it to train cops. Mm -hmm. um, and that does not surprise me because we know now that Tom Cruise is a guy who throws himself into learning how to do things to be as authentic as possible. Um, I doubt he actually killed people. Um, but I wouldn't put it past him. Um, you don't know. And uh, back with the cops, Peter Berg is here now. Um, and uh, they find a casing in the apartment. 
And Ruffalo remembers a story about a night of killings in Oakland where a cabbie went around killing a bunch of different people. And some cops always thought there was another person in the car giving those orders. Dun, dun, dun. Mm -hmm. Vincent takes Max to a jazz club. This is one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie. Mm -hmm. He basically says, we've got extra time. Let's go listen to jazz. Do you like jazz? And Max is like, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> and so they listen to a little bit of jazz. And Vincent is so impressed with one of the players. He asks the waitress, hey, can you have this guy come over and I'll buy him a drink when the set is done? Um, and it's you know played like this is just this classic jazz guy who, well, he even tells a story about playing with Miles Davis for 20 minutes on stage. And uh, Vincent is awed by this story. And then drops a casual line like, I, I wish I could tell this story to the men in two C name cities. I don't remember. Cartagena, I don't remember. Um, yeah, Cartagena is one of them. Is it? Oh, awesome. Um, yeah. That is clearly a signal as the jazz man's face goes dead. Um, and he repeats the cities um, and basically realizes he's about to be killed and then begs for his life, says, I'll run away. You'll never hear from me again. Um, and Max says, okay, or Vincent says, okay. We'll do a trivia question. If you get it right, I'll let you go. If not, and he asks him where Miles Davis learned to play jazz. And the guy says, well, everybody knows that. He went to Juilliard at age, whatever. And Vincent immediately shoots the dude in the head. And Max, understandably, wigs out. Uh, there have been killings tonight, but none were right in front of him, uh, two feet from his face. And Vincent will later tell us and Max that the actual answer to the question was that he dropped out of Juilliard after a few months and learned everything from... Charlie Parker. Thank you, Charlie Parker. All right. So um, they have now killed three of the five victims, um, but the cabbie's boss is calling him incessantly. So he gets on the radio, and the cabbie's boss says, your mom wouldn't stop calling me. She's calling me every 10 minutes. Why didn't you show up, she says. And Vincent says, wait, you visit your mom in the hospital every night? And Max is like, yes. It's like, then we got to do it. Because we can't have any out-of-the-ordinary things happening tonight, even though... Everything he's making Max do is out of the ordinary tonight. He's not picking up fares. He's not talking on the radio to his bosses. But this one thing, got to go see your mom in the hospital. Doesn't make tons of sense to me, but I don't care because it's a pretty cool scene. They end up actually sharing an elevator with Ruffalo's character, who I believe is named Fanning. Yeah. Um, and uh, while Vincent is talking to Max's mom, charming her, Max idiotically grabs Vincent's briefcase and bolts. Um and uh, there's a there's a foot chase because Tom Cruise always has to run. Yep. And they end up on this sidewalk overpass over the highway. And Max throws the briefcase over where it's destroyed by a passing semi. And <coughs> that was dumb. Uh, we cut over to the morgue and Ruffalo is shown multiple bodies dispatched execution style and finds the body of a lawyer who is a criminal connected to the first crime scene's victim. So now the cops are starting to put the pieces together. Uh, Vince has Max taken to a place to meet Felix, who's connected with the people that hired Vincent, and basically says, because you threw all my stuff away, I'm going to make you go in there and pretend to be me to get backup copies for the last two victims. And uh, he does, uh, surprisingly. Uh, but we also find out here that there are law enforcement people surveilling this club that Felix is in. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they see him go in, they even spot the taxi after Ruffalo shows up. They spot the damage on the taxi. They grab the license plate for the taxi. Um, so things are going to get hot, hot, hot. Inside, Max is finding some kind of inner will and drama training from high school. And uh, I suppose this is all adrenaline. But he actually turns into the guy he needs to be for about 30 or 40 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, shows some confidence uh, and is able to get uh, the backup files on a thumb drive. But by now, the cops have analyzed audio of him entering, calling himself Vincent, and they have figured out the next possible target. And there are air and land units headed to the same place as Max. It's a club called Fever. Um, <laughs> and this is a pretty cool scene. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the guys that Vincent hired, or the guys that hired Vincent are also on their way to the club so that if Vincent messes up, they will kill him. Um, <clears throat> but don't forget, they think that Max is Vincent. It's all very convoluted. Before they get to the club, Max and Vincent have an incredibly symbolic encounter with a lone coyote. Uh, and then they move on to the club. The club scene is absolute chaos, but it's chaos that, from a filmmaking standpoint, is controlled. Um, even though you don't know where everyone is precisely at all times, uh, you know enough to know enough. Uh, and Vincent gives Max instructions to use him as a decoy, sends him out on the floor, and then slowly starts taking out the private guards of this witness that 
he's trying to kill. And then he assassinates the witness. Uh, Fanning, that's Ruffalo's character, finally realizes that Max isn't Vincent and walks him outside to be to safety, only to be immediately assassinated by Vincent in one of the more shocking moments of the film. Mm-hmm. He forces Max back, back in the cab. They take off, but now there are multiple helicopters in the air looking for them. They bicker in the car, and eventually Max is convinced by Vincent's philosophy of life that nothing really matters and intentionally wrecks the car um, <clears throat> so that he can get away. Uh, he does crash the taxi, um, but Vincent runs away, and a single cop shows up, and he's super helpful at first. He's like, no, dude, you've been in a car accident. Sit down, relax. And then as he's checking out the car, he sees the body in the trunk now that the trunk has been popped partially open by the accident and starts trying to arrest Max. But in another of the biggest coincidences of my lifetime, as Max is about to be handcuffed, he looks into the crashed taxi and sees that Vincent's files have spilled. And there is the the (laughs) name and photo of the next victim. And not only that, not only that. It's Jada Pinkett from the beginning of the movie. Yeah. He got her phone number. Um, yeah. So he overpowers the cop, grabs a gun. He repeats Vincent's line here from earlier, telling the cop, when did this become a negotiation? And I think that's pretty mm-hmm. awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then he doesn't, he can't get a phone signal. This is 2004, so I'm willing to forgive cell phone signal issues because they, they were real back then. Um, and he ends up a, in a parking garage climbing to the top, and he's actually at, the foot of the law building that Jada Pinkett is in, and he finally gets a signal and he calls her, and we're intercutting now between him trying to warn her and uh, Vincent entering the building using the swipe keys that he got somehow from, I don't know, Um, and uh, stalking her, and this is a classic movie thing here where he arrives at the office before she's had had time to go anywhere, only for us to find out she's not currently in her office. She's two floors up in the law library. And so first, Max is like, well, just stay there. He doesn't know you're there, <clears throat> but he starts to lose his battery on his cell phone, of course, <clears throat> and it, the calls keep dropping. And then Vincent, who is smarter than anyone else in this whole movie, looks down and sees the lit line on the phone and realizes that somebody is somewhere in this building on the phone and he knows it's her. And he, I think, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think he can deduce from the phone light what floor she's on. There's a label underneath the light okay. that says 14th floor. Okay, so he starts yeah. looking up. And then Max finally gets back through to her and says, he knows you're there now. Oh, crap, I was wrong. He knows you're there now. But the phone dies, and there's no choice but for Max to run in there and try and save her. Um, Max shows up just as Vincent finds her and shoots Vincent, runs off with the lawyer. But then there's a chase because, of course, Vincent isn't dead. Uh, There's an awesome moment where Vincent throws an office chair through a pane of glass and then goes to jump over it, but actually lands on it and falls awkwardly over to the side. And I did read that that was a complete accident that the director loved, so they kept it in, <laughs> um, which I think is awesome. Um, <clears throat> they take the elevator down. Vincent takes the stairs. I'm not sure what's going on there. And also, Vincent has, like, a weird ability to know which direction they went. Um, yeah. But he follows them. They end up at the subway, and I need your guys' help here because they go down to the subway main floor. They look at a track where there's a train, and then Max looks down, and there's a second subfloor, and they go down there. Vincent comes in at the same staircase and ends up not going downstairs and going straight across and jumping a track, and then somehow they're all on the same train. And I don't know if the movie is saying Max and the lawyer went back up the stairs on the other side, and that's why they were crawling on their hands and knees to get into the train on the main platform. I got a little confused with the editing there. That's one thing I did not notice, so I I have no (laughs) idea. It could also be just saying that since they're on the second floor, we just assumed Vincent went down to the second floor as well. They just didn't show us. Yeah, so there's something 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 like that. They didn't show us that we're supposed to assume. Uh, yeah, there's I, there's something cat and mouse going on there, like extra, you know, sensory perception from Cruz's character to get to the right train that they're yeah. trying to do. I didn't quite follow it either. So okay. um, anyway, they see him coming. They take off to the front of the subway car. Um, there's a pretty awesome moment where the train stops at a station. And the doors open and they're kind of hidden from him right now. But Vincent steps outside the train and just basically waits for them to pop their head out. It's a very French Connection kind of uh, yeah. um, homage. I mean, it's a little bit different from what French Connection does, but it still get, gives you the reminder. Yeah, and uh, so they they stay on the train, um, and the doors close, and he creeps closer and closer, and then the, you know 
power of lights going off at the right time uh, leads to a, a shootout where Max doesn't get hit and Vincent gets hit. It's wild. And then uh, Vincent struggles a little bit and sits down. And then he references a story he told earlier about a man dying on the MTA and it taking days before anyone ever noticed mm -hmm. and asks if anyone will notice him. Uh, and then uh, he dies. And uh, we do see the lawyer and Max walking a bit. But... <laughs> and that's how the movie ends, which is to me, like, there's so much more left after this. Like, how does he explain this to anybody? Yes. You know, yes. <laughs> he's still going to be wanted for murder. Uh, yes. After this. <laughs> he still so... has a lot of explaining to do for sure. Yes. Um, so... <clears throat> All right, Aaron, Chris, what are your guys' thoughts this time through on Collateral? Um, I love Collateral. Exactly what you were talking about. Michael Mann and L.A. is a really good uh, combo. Um, you know, if, you, if you've seen Heat, then you're going to – this is like the more action-y version of Heat where it's, you know, it's – it's not, it doesn't have a lot of long, the only long conversation is the jazz club. And that's such an, you know, interesting uh, thing that, you know, heat's got a lot of those like very ponderous conversations, you know, and you're like, it, you could fall asleep to it, but yeah. it, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it, they're that way, but this movie's always constantly moving. Um, the, I think it's funny the the coincidence of, of him not only seeing that Jada Pinkett is his next victim, is one thing but also i don't know if you're a if you're a drug cartel what killing the prosecutor is going to do in this situation yeah uh it's not like if you kill her the case goes away it's there will be other lawyers that come up afterwards that's the point <laughs> yes. of these big cases whereas after the that. witnesses those once they die they're gone you're they're gone witnesses <laughs> makes sense you know it totally makes sense i also <laughs> I also never really understood, maybe he explains this. I never really understood why Vincent needs the cab this whole time. Maybe he needs somebody who knows LA and he can get around fast and all that. Maybe that's the point. I think so. But I think if you're a professional and, and, and I think if you're a professional, you would know kind of like how to get to places if you need to. I mean, as you said, he seems to know where all these guys were, uh, Jamie Fox is at any time. So yep. if he's got that kind of like heat seeking, uh, heat -seeking. Uh, ability, then, you know, you, you would think that so I never really understood that. And, and of course the keeping of the body in the trunk is a, is a massive convenience for later so that the big thing, that big, you know, crash and cop discovers it thing happens and everything. But, um, but, uh, cause I don't, if you're, if you're, storing a body in a trunk and you're worried that people are going to find it <laughs> there's a number of people who could be seeing you right now do that so why well, don't i just doesn't move the body the somewhere victim. out of the, what's the that guy in, the guy they didn't, none of the other victims go in the trunk he doesn't hide any of the other bodies so right. i think i think partially what we're supposed to believe is that that max is the the um what's the word i'm looking for he's he's framing max so the body in the trunk is one way to make sure that Max is connected to all of these crimes and the, in the end of the that day. Makes sense. Well, so I, it, so I think he's purposefully him, doing that. Then don't throw him on top of the cab and make it, uh, make him a cop magnet throughout the rest of the Well, and he, it, he explains that away by saying he shot him and it was the, the fall, the bullet in the fall is what killed him. So yeah, I think he's trying to say he didn't throw him out, but he shot him in front of the window and the guy staggered back and fell out. I don't know. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't I, I I don't think that there's anything other than you pointing a gun at his head that makes the anything. I mean, like, yeah, you can frame him, but who's going to be looking for you anyway? I don't I, I don't think mm. that I think that's still a plot device. I still think it's just a, a way to make things more on edge when they don't need to be. So some um, of what I some of what I read from man was that uh, that the, the, the Vincent character it very purposefully picks the Fox character as the, and Patsy was the word I was looking for and the chat came through with that. Thank you for that. Uh, as the Patsy in this and that even the Jada Pinkett Smith thing is not a coincidence. That's purposeful that that cabbie gave her a ride already. And he was tracking, you know, that to have that in, you know, be part of the evidence and part of the suspect. But he wasn't, he, and he then, didn't, he almost didn't get into that cab. Yeah. And sure. then, and then the uh, and then the 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 other thing was that that man said was something about there's something early on where 
he says something to the Jamie Foxx character to see how aggressive he will be. So he knows if he will go along with, you know, everything uh, on the night. So I, there's mm. there's some framework laid there. I don't know that it's well executed. I think yeah, it's possibly the issue. Yeah, I think, I think I'll issue. settle on that. Like, yeah. that's what they were going for. But I don't think yeah. it's, it supports the weight of it. But Correct. Um, the one, I, one thing I do like about this, and I, I saw a comment earlier, like, you know, that said, you know, this is the, this is the perfect uh, scenario for an, a protagonist to be, you know, to have an antagonist come in his life and make his life better. Um, mm -hmm. because, and, and I feel like kind of that's the point of the, the sort of the, uh, I think it's sort of the point of the movie. Cause I was in, sitting there thinking gun to your head. What would you do all the way through this? Like, uh, everybody keeps asking Jamie Foxx what he wants to do. And he's like, I want to start this limo service. That's, you know, that's got all this awesome music and takes you to paradise and all this other type of stuff. And, um, and he's got the, he's got the number of the hot lady and all this other type of stuff. And he's not calling and, and Tom Cruise keeps asking him, why don't you go ahead and ask, why don't you go ahead and start your business? Why don't you go ahead and call the hot lady and get a date and blah, blah, blah. And he's just like, oh, I just want everything to be perfect. I want to make sure everything is right before I do that. And people who do that, and I, <laughs> I'm one of these people, um, you know, who constantly look for that perfect setting or whatever, end up not doing things because mm -hmm. that's the re that's what happens to your life after a while. And, you know, after a while, you're going to be looking at yourself at 60 or 70 and going, whoa, what happened to the, to the time? And then later on, Jamie Foxx actually says the phrase gun to your head uh, when he's uh, zooming through L.A. and mm -hmm. everything. And I was like, I feel like somebody asked Michael Mann or the writer of this movie, whatever, you know, gun your head. What do you want to do with your life? And then they sort of patterned a movie all around that <laughs> type of thing. Uh, like, what are you going to do with your life uh, if 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 someone gives you like no choice to do it? You know, you just just think you just got to do it, you know. So that's what I love about uh, that's the uh, sort of the secondary reason why I love collateral as well. Mm. Uh, I love this movie. Uh, it was an absolute joy to watch it again. It holds up for me. I, I think the, the thing that, that one of the things that man seems to do really, really well, um, not always, but mostly uh, is he really understands structure and how the visuals should impact the structure. So like, this is a great script, by the way. So that's that's you know start number one, and I guess the the guy who wrote it wrote it in college, and then just kept refining it over the years, and had a friend who finally encouraged him to turn it in. So you can tell it's like been like really refined and fine tuned because the structure in this is uh, lots of setups and payoffs. Um, you know, Jeremy, I think you used the phrase "this will be important later." Yeah, uh, this is kind of that could be the subtitle of the movie, "Collateral." Yeah. This will be important later <laughs> uh, because there's just so much great setup and payoff in the structure, and it's uh, and nothing feels wasted. Um, I love the technical way man shoots some of the stuff, especially in that final chase. There are some shots with faces in the foreground that are just evocative in a way that uh, a lot of a lot of filmmakers don't use. And um, uh, there's there's also a shot again with a face in the foreground. It's Tom Cruise's giant face and you've got the lights of the subway behind him. It's just this beautiful shot. Mm -hmm. And man is always looking for that stuff, I think, and and using yeah. it well. And I don't think lingers on it too much either. One of the best shots, city skyline shots of LA I've ever seen in this movie. When they're on the car driving on that highway and you see it into the right side and everything, yeah. it's unbelievable. Man also does that stuff that I like too, where he ha he films behind the head of somebody who's looking off into the mm -hmm. distance. He does that in almost everything. Even Ferrari recently, he did that. So it was yeah. just a, he's got, you can always tell it's a Michael Mann movie. Uh, yeah. When, when you see the, the the choices and the angles and everything yeah that's good i, I also like there's uh the way he frames the driving shots where uh, jamie fox is driving and tom cruise is in the vehicle Cruise is to the left of the driver you do not see people shoot car scenes like this they put the person in the middle of the back seat so that they can be seen in a regular like rearview mirror kind of shot. And what that does is it it gives this like sinister feel to 
everything Tom Cruise says, says to him because he's completely out of his sight. He's sitting right behind him and it just feels a little off. Just like stuff like that just really builds the, the tension, I think, in the, the feel of this movie. Um, and just a few things that, that I noticed this time through. Um, I also wonder why we haven't had a, a collateral sequel with uh, Jason Statham. It's perfect. It's right there. We know he's in this somehow, and, uh, mm -hmm. and that that would be uh, that would be amazing. And, and he makes franchises that are just like this constantly. Like this is his right. Wheelhouse. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. And Although, like you yeah, said, he... Jamie Foxx has a lot of unanswered questions. So Jamie Foxx could be in it again, and it's time uh, Statham <laughs> is the one uh, that's, that's <laughs> driving him around. So yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, it's time for our super secret double feature. Be very, very quiet. Secret? What secret? Our dirty little secret. I tell you something I've never told anyone. Uh, do you have more? I have more than one in case you want to go first, just in case. Uh... I have one, but I did come up with a couple others. So. Okay, all right. I'll go ahead and go. I, I, I went with Drive. I, I think this is a I, – I pondered Baby Driver because that character is a little more innocent uh, in, like, getting pulled into something like Jamie Foxx mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. But Drive has the better tone match and the better theme match, I think, with what's going on in, in Collateral. And it, it feels like a series of connections and falling deeper into this hole, even though Gosling's character from the beginning – is doing side work that's like this um he still feels caught up in a way that i feel uh in collateral as well so drive felt like a, a good double feature um kind of felt the same and also has that city nightlife kind of thing going for it too so mm. yeah yeah i like it um mine is going to be falling down uh the, mm -hmm. and mainly just because of the la connection and the you know how la is a character in the movie and you have um you know falling down probably should be a big recommend one day uh but uh it's one of those i michael douglas going through and and basically just this is like a man's just like i've had it with everything about the world and and la is a perfect representation of it uh type of thing going on i think i think it would go well with this movie uh so that's the one that i thought so i like um, it i like uh, it Okay. All right. Well, that means next week's movie. It's on me again. And um, so I'm going back to uh, my comedies of the decade uh, thing. And um, I thought very, I thought a long time on this one. I didn't know where I wanted to go. I feel like we started this podcast to bring you movies that you maybe haven't seen before and that's sort of the the gist of it and through the first few of these decades here i'm not as well versed in those decades so a lot of the times it came down to movies that were popular back in the day uh now that we're hitting the 70s i there's a, a whole bunch more to choose from that i have seen and that i have to struggle over and it's going to get worse and worse as it gets into the 80s 90s and aughts and everything else because i'm gonna have so many to choose from at that point uh so i debated between blazing saddles and young frankenstein but i thought that those have had their due um and uh i thought of a lot of woody allen stuff but i felt like half the audience wouldn't want to watch a woody allen movie so mm. i didn't want to do that um i know i'm not afraid to recommend a woody allen movie but at the same time i want kind of everybody to be in on it so <laughs> we did a we here. did uh match point i think oh, uh, while you were here yeah. a few months ago we did match oh yeah <laughs> match point no, i was not here for that okay yeah. well that's a good one um it is but um so I am, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the well of Peter Sellers and, mm. uh, and, uh, recommend, uh, being there from 1979. Um, and, uh, this movie is absolutely, uh, fantastic. Um, it's so unusual. You, you cannot, you will not be able to forget this afterwards, but Peter Sellers plays, uh, a person who, is so simple in his in his thoughts that people think that he is saying very profound things and he gets in with just the right crowd not that he's looking for this uh and says some of these things that make him appear like he's ready to be like a serious politician and and heavy player and they and people keep pushing him towards that goal 
that he has absolutely no idea that's what <laughs> is happening. That's he, he is so simple in his thoughts that he has absolutely no idea what's going on around him, really. And so um, this is a great, great movie to discuss it. Um, but yes, I, I saw also The Jerk thrown into the... That was another one that I thought of. But The Jerk is also another movie I feel like a lot of people know and have seen, and it's gotten its due. And I would love to do The Jerk, but uh, this time... We're going to do something that's kind of a dark comedy, kind of a satire. It'll be interesting to discuss this one. Mm, so. ah, this is in my list of shame, so thank you for helping me tick that box. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing it. From yes, my... and, and I also discussed, I also thought of Kentucky Fried Movie for this, which is, you know, the only reason I didn't do that is just because there are a couple scenes. There's actually a couple scenes in a lot of these movies that are just named. <laughs> I don't know... I just don't know. Uh, and we're at a point, we're at a point where it's like, I'm not afraid to recommend some of these movies, but at the same time, it's just, uh, let's do something. Let's do something like this. That's got maybe a couple of offensive things in it uh, and not so stark and in your face. Um, um, it looks like this movie is free on YouTube with ads. Um, oh yeah. Which is a, a nice change of pace. Um, you can also rent it from all your usual, uh, places but um i just pulled it mm. up on youtube uh and started playing it and uh, working just fine so <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah all right uh i guess we got a time for a question or two question question i got something to say i want the truth i am listening i guess we've got time for a question or two famous last words uh <laughs> let's say you were offered to do a show where you explore a country or culture with a celebrity co-host where are you going and with whom, and why is Jeremy going to Italy with Justin Timberlake? <laughs> mm, mm -hmm, mm, I might have yep. said that I want to be friends with Justin Timberlake one too many times over the years. Uh, mm -hmm. And that may not be something people want to hear anymore lately. Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, I uh, would like to tour Sweden with Stellan Skarsgård. Ooh, that's good I feel like he probably probably knows the, the place pretty well by this point. I would think know? so. Mm -hmm. In that so. in that same vein, I am uh, having Peter Jackson take me around New Zealand, uh, mm -hmm. show mm -hmm. me all the sights and all the peoples. Yeah, yeah. I talked to my wife about going to visit New Zealand, and she looked it up on a map, and it was too tiny. <laughs> so, wait, <laughs> wait, hold on. <laughs> wait, I'm very confused right now. What do you mean too tiny? It's too small. It's too small. <laughs> but what does that? How does that impact wanting to go there? It feels like she might be swallowed if she went there. Got it. Sure. Okay. All right. Yep. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so tiny, um, far away from land. <clears throat> looks like in the chat we've got. Let's see. Australia with Sam Neill, Hugh Jackman, Australia, Austria with Daniel Bruhl, Bruhl, and then uh, Togobot says I would go around Sweden, but with Rebecca Ferguson. Good call. Very good call. Fair. Um. Yeah. Absolutely. England with uh, uh, Kenneth Branagh would be on there. So yeah. Absolutely. I um, I I got two answers. I, I if you trace my lineage back, it's like Scottish and Scottish and French Canadian. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I would go to Scotland with Ewan McGregor. Um, he has already done a couple of motorcycle-based travel documentary shows, so I think he would be really into this. Um, but then I also remembered I really like food, so maybe I would go to Japan with a, mm. a, a cuisine expert like uh, Masaharu Morimoto of mm. Iron Chef fame mm. um, to get a, a cuisine-based tour of that culture. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I like all of our vacation ideas. Let's let, Why don't we turn that into a show? Why don't we do that? I'll call <laughs> Timberlake. Um, mm, yep, yep, yep. I've got you call Scar Scar Scar. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. I'll, right. let, uh, uh, I'll let Peter Jackson know. Let's do another one. Um, name a movie that was ruined by a bad ending and name a bad movie saved by a good ending. Oh, wow. I don't know if the bad ending ruined these movies, but they certainly left you coming out of the theater going, uh, did I, uh, I liked everything else. Uh, um, the departed of course has one of the all time like endings where you're like, <laughs> by the time, uh, every like everybody's getting shot at the end and then Wahlberg shoots Damon and the rat shows up on the balcony <laughs> you're you're laughing your ass I laughed my ass off with all these people getting shot it's like you were expecting you were expecting everyone to get shot that's how <laughs> ridiculous it was at the end um and unbreakable has that just very abrupt well. like 
after they after Sam Jackson like does that whole like reveal and everything and it's like da na na there's the text this is what happened to your characters goodbye thank you for just thank you for coming to this movie um we ran out of film <laughs> yeah exactly um as far as bad movie with a good ending these are harder because i don't watch as many bad movies and i don't really think many of them get saved by a good ending but uh i thought new mutants was one of these movies um i didn't like new mutants all the way through until anya taylor joy started kicking all the ass at the end of the totally movie. agree totally agree so that was that was pretty much i was like oh did i like this movie no nah, i didn't like it which but movie? that ending was good what which movie new mutants oh yeah 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 i actually mm -hmm. liked that movie more than most people mm -hmm. um but yeah that movie's weird weirdly messy yeah. but likable likable mm -hmm. and weirdly messy um aaron uh for good movie with a bad ending uh wonder woman is what i i went yeah. i i was Holy loving cow. loving that movie and then the end just went it almost is like the end just threw its hands hands up and was like i guess we're a superhero movie and this is what we do you know, and it's just like, all right, but that's kind of boring and typical. Um, so so that would be my answer for that. As far as a good movie with a bad ending, I would like to associate myself with the remarks of the gentleman in the red shirt, which is Chris. Uh, this is really hard for me because I don't think it saves the movie. I just, they're very, I, like, I couldn't think of a movie where a great ending saved what was already a, a, a bad movie. Um because oftentimes in my brain, if the ending's great and it changes the rest of the movie, it's a good movie. It's not a bad movie with a good ending. Uh, so anyways, but I went with Anchorman 2. Um, I didn't really oh, enjoy yeah. Anchorman 2, but that ending had me rolling. And just cameo after cameo after cameo showing up and just ma ultimate madness at the end. I just love that it. That is great. The only thing I didn't like, well, I didn't like Anchorman 2 in general, but... No, me either. The, the, the only thing about that ending is a it's of course derivative of the first movie i mean they, they mm -hmm. may just be like hey let's just let's just go balls to the wall here but then the other part of it is all of those actors are clearly like shot on different days and everything mm -hmm. and they're not yes. interact yes. with yes. each other <laughs> yes and i hate that they there's not a, a you know interaction with all those stars at the end but yes that is a fun like way to end that movie yeah i uh I think I've gone on record before about the, how much I hate the ending of Eyes Wide Shut um, and how, despite how bizarre that journey is, it hooks me and pulls me in. And I'm right there with him all the way up until the end. And it just kills it for me. Um, again, I agree with both of you. I'm not sure there's a bad movie that has an ending good enough to actually save the whole movie. But Bodies, Bodies, Bodies was one where about three-fourths of the way through the movie, I was like, I am so sick of this fucking shit. It is so much like everything I've seen before. Yes, this generation seems to be too obsessed with their phones and their blogs and the, uh, people are entitled. And But then there's a thing that happens, and I, it's a new enough movie I don't really want to get too into it, but there's a thing that happens that casts everything in a brand new light that had me rolling um, mm -hmm. and uh, it's almost worth watching just for that. Although I don't think it makes the movie good. So there you go. Mm -hmm. All right. Nice. I think that's going to do it. Uh, you want to wrap us up, Chris? Um, all right. Well, that'll do it for this week. Next week we'll be being there. Uh, who's not going to be there. Aaron's not going to be there. That's right. Um, wah, wah. Playing hooky. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, he's, he's off doing important movie critic things so but he will supply know. us with his pick for the following episode so that we can give you your homework at the end yes. Mm -hmm. yeah yes he will. yes he will but uh again thanks a lot chat for showing up and mm -hmm. uh, watching us uh today uh we appreciate you so much for coming out and uh and doing that and supporting us so anyway that's going to do it for this week we'll see you next week see ya and one other oh. thing, uh, next week we'll be at uh, 11 a.m., not 11.15. We are moving the start time of the broadcast That's right. Uh, uh -huh. to, That's 11, right. to 11 a.m. So we'll see you at 11 a.m. Uh, next well, week. Actually, see you those, next we'll week. see a few of you at 11.15 who don't get the memo or forget and then come in partway through the show. <laughs> so. Yes, exactly. Anyway, yes, we will be here a little bit earlier next week. So anyway, uh, that'll do it for this week. We'll see you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 
part of the live show by being a member of the Sin Club at Patreon at patreon.com slash cinemasins. Chat with us on the Cinemasins Discord at discord.gg slash cinemasins or Cinemasins Twitter at cinemasins and email any comments or questions to recotopia at cinemasins.com. That's R-E-C-O-T-O-P-I-A at cinemasins.com. She went backstage for the rest of the show and then left a few minutes before it ended. But The View and most of the internet decided she left right then and there because she didn't mm. like that joke. And like yeah. The View was telling her, just smile and accept the joke. Mm. This is why I tweeted last night. She has no control over when the cameras cut to her. It's not her freaking mm. fault. You're basically yeah. saying it's evil that she's famous and she just wants to watch her boyfriend play ball. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, not her fault she's a mega star and the cameras are going to cut to her all the time i get yeah. i imagine she's really tired of hearing about it <laughs> oh yeah i didn't uh i didn't watch the globes i i'm not as morally opposed to them anymore now that they cut the you know hollywood foreign press out of the equation supposedly yeah. we'll see uh but uh the the meme that has come from it that i love the most is the jennifer lawrence one i don't know if you mentioned this one. Oh yeah no. where it cuts to her during her nomination like that you know how they do all the nominees and it cuts to them before the awards give it out and she mouths very clearly if i don't win this i'm leaving and she goes yep. like this <laughs> <laughs> yep. it's, like, yeah. it's like in the running man where uh where um Richard Dawson's like, sorry, we're experiencing technical difficulties. <laughs> and the old lady's like, bullshit. <laughs> Pull the strings. <laughs> yes, uh, the, the puppet is weeping, but you yourself are not weeping. <laughs> uh, what were you saying when my uh, audio cut out? I was curious to hear uh, your thoughts on the the michigan thing. Oh, i was gonna ask you that was all that was the that michigan was spying on other teams is that what happened so they had a guy uh somebody on like one of the lower level guys named connor stallions would buy tickets for other teams games and mm -hmm. he would buy tickets specifically across from their sidelines and then videotape you know their oh. signals and the plays that were happening which is technically illegal so yeah although that will probably probably change although like just general game film would tell you a lot wouldn't that's, it? it wouldn't tell you everything maybe that's the but... thing, like and and so and so then people are like well you know jim harbaugh knew about it because he's standing next to him and, and tells him you know the signs and then they you know run a play well that's what every team every team has this person who is supposed to try to figure out what the signs are and tell them to the coach. Um, yeah. But they're not supposed to go to other games. They don't even do and signs, do they? Don't they call it in over a microphone? That's the rule that's going to change. They're not allowed to have headsets in college football. And oh, so they I are, know that. Yeah, so they're going to change that. And it's so it seems to me, I will be surprised if the NCAA does anything other than like a little hand slap or anything. I highly doubt they'll negate the season or the championship I don't watch or anything of but... college football so they have to turn and look at the sideline and they get like a base stealing sign every yes. time yeah oh my god yeah that seems ripe for danger yeah, why yeah. Not you'll, see, microphones? you'll see these like very intricate posters that they hold up a lot of times it'll be mm -hmm. like three eyeballs <laughs> and like <laughs> oh my god hieroglyphics it was it was fun though. Uh, it's it's been many years, and that 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 is a no matter what that is a great college football team. They they are they are a pretty incredible team. So mm -hmm. it was it was fun to yeah. watch them. It's like, so you think uh, Harbaugh is going to the NFL now? Mm, I do, but I wouldn't be surprised if he stayed. Um, there's a rumor going around that he and JJ McCarthy are going to stay and run it back. Um, but that's probably just wishful thinking for Michigan fans. Well, and you. You really have to hope for a lot of things to just just go right, especially with their go. schedule next year. They have a yeah. crazy hard schedule next year. So, so. the reason yeah. for him to go pro would be a huge payday, right? Yes, like mm -hmm. he went pro and failed, and then got a huge payday payday to go to Michigan, and now assume assume the success there will get him an even bigger payday in the NFL. Yes, Is that how it works. Yeah. Yeah, well, he wants to win a Super Bowl. I mean, you know, for him, I think for him, it's it's also the competition too. Like, you know, he he likes to win. I thought you were talking many, about McCarthy at first, but how many college coaches have gone to the NFL besides the Seattle guy and super succeeded? Mm. Uh, P. 
Pete Carroll's really the only one that I can yeah. think of right off the top of my He's head. He's kind of so. an anomaly in that regard. Yeah. I there's some I think there's something to be said for just being the legend and just, you know, living out your days being the legend and drawing millions of dollars every year to, to coach football, but you know, whatever. I mean, I think what happened But Harbaugh's is, already had success. That's the thing about him. He yes. he went to a Super Bowl. Yes. So yeah. Once he, you get to a certain level of wealth, it's not enough anymore. People go, people just want more. Well, it's just, yeah. So, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to leave the the uh, impression that we didn't realize that Harbaugh went to a freaking Super Bowl. <laughs> yes. 